Vixia. He is, of course, one of the stars of the neonatology in uh, India, being a NEBI member, being an IP neonatology chapter chairperson in the past, and he has several achievements to his credit. Welcome, Dr. Sanjay. I hope you rename yourself because everybody currently are Sarita or Arti Marias on this group. So please name and then we will go forward. We are extremely thrilled to have Dr. Uma Ali. Dr. Uma Ali is, um, is a legend in the field of pediatric nephrology. All of us have been uh, her sort of students, learned from her. And um, I don't think we, if you have to go through all this, there are so many, but you have been a leader and you have taught so many students, madam. And um, you have been the dean of BJ Vadia uh, Hospital for, Chil for Children in Mumbai. And currently you are working in Leelavati Hospital, Jupiter Hospital, Thane, and you have several, several major achievements. We're all very, very eager to uh, listen to you. Most welcome, madam. And um, we were supposed to have Dr. Mehul Shah, who will join us if the Hyderabad traffic permits him to. Um, Dr. Mehul Shah is... Um, Dr. Mehul Shah is pediatric nephrologist in Apollo Hospital, Hyderabad. And he's again a very senior pediatric nephrologist. And I do hope that he'll be able to join us and we'll be able to uh, hear from him. Um, we also have Dr. Kanishka Das, another stalwart in the field of pediatric surgery. I would say someone who has magic in his hands. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with him in St. John's Medical College and we miss him now where he's moved on to Ames Bhubaneswar. Again, an uh, extremely passionate teacher, a perfectionist, and it's such a pleasure to have you here, sir. Then coming lastly, but not the least, to our fellow neonatologist, Dr. Mangala Bharati. Um, Dr. Mangala Bharati is um, DM Neonatology again from PGI and the professor and head of the Department of Neonatology in Madras <laughs> Medical College. Uh, he's the innovator among us, the neonatologist with the most number of innovations, I would say. You have not put that here, but uh, he's also interested in perinatal interventions, devices, research methodology, and milk banking. Uh, several papers, as long as, you know, his huge clinical load mm -hmm. permit. And so glad to have you, Dr. Mangla, to give us a very, very balanced view of the whole issue. And Hi. then we have Dr. Amit Upadhyay. Dr. Amit Upadhyay is DM Neonatology from Ames, New Delhi, and he was a former head of pediatrics in uh, LLRM, Meerut. And currently, he heads his own unit in Meerut, and um, he again has several um, um, accolades to his credit with several publications. Thank you, Dr. Amit. And now I hand over to Dr. Sanjay Vazi to take on the panel discussion. Over to you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Suman, and uh, thank you, everyone, to have allowed me this opportunity to be here and uh, discuss something which often neglected, you know, urine hito hai, so, so who would bother about a urine, uh, you know, so when we were doing neonatology, when we started, so everybody was only bothered about ventilation and maybe asphyxia at that time, and the biggest thing was sepsis, but, you know, over the course of uh, years, I've realized that, like, you know, uh, the biggest uh, challenge is managing a child with acute renal failure in 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 um, the NICU, and uh, we know that the mortality shoots up uh, significantly higher when when we deal with children who have an underlying or uh, accompanying uh, acute kidney injury. Now, uh, I thank my panelists uh, who con who are here, and uh, the Nivedita has actually covered most of the points. But uh, we also would see the world from a neonatologist perspective because that was a pediatric neonatologist. Uh, uh, and to get the ball rolling, like, you know, uh, we just uh, talked about, uh, you know, the definition of uh, and the diagnosis. Now, as a neonatologist, I want to start with you, Amit. You know, how do you diagnose uh, AKI and monitor in the clinical practice? Because, you know, okay, that's the definition is fine, point three. And, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on the definition part in case you want to. Amit? Yes, sir. 
I am Mr. Keegan. So I was asking you, like, you know, so if you can just, uh, you know, tell us how do you define uh, or or uh, define neonatal AKI in, yeah. you know, diagnose and how do you monitor in, in clinical yes. practice? Because our neonatologist so, way of thinking is slightly different from nephrologist. Yes. Um, so AKI, which was previously referred as um, ARA for acute renal failure, is defined as an abrupt decrease in GFR leading to accumulation of nitrogenous wastes and dysregulation of fluid electrolyte and acid-base homeostasis. So this is uh, the standard book definition of uh, AKI. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, if we have to class it, uh, define it as in numbers, then it can be classified into as uh, non-oliguric and oliguric, non-oliguric, and based on site or region, it can be classified as pre-renal, intrinsic renal, or post-renal. It is classified on basis of uh, serum creatinine mostly, and serum creatinine of 1.5 to 1.9 fold uh, to baseline, or more than 0.3 milligram per deciliter increase, is considered as uh, ARF. Yeah. Most often, neonatologists are very uh, inclined into knowing what is the threshold or, um, uh, or creatinine beyond which we say that it is definitely AKI which is there. So there is no such cutoff which is there. But um, we only have to look at increase at uh, serum creatinine. And um, uh, if more than 0.3 to 0.5 milligram serum creatinine has increased from baseline, then uh, it should be considered a renal injury. Uh, so, so how do you monitor? Do you use NIRS in your practice, or or is there a value of NIRS in your practice uh, to look at so blood or or even like other markers of any any kind that you use in clinical practice, or you go by by serum creatinine? And one of the points you majorly manifested is that we used to when we were uh, residents, we were only looking at serum creatinine more than one point two. That was the cutoff and gold standard. But now. Like, you know, as you mentioned that any rise more than 0.3 from the previous value could still be, uh, you know, an AKI. Uh, are you able to hear? You, you use NIRS in your practice for me? Um, yes, I can hear. Are you not able to hear anyone? No, I'm I'm able to hear you, but voice is a bit uh, toned down. Uh, so I, I was saying, do you use NIRS? Mm. Mangla, Mangla, can you hear? Yes, yeah. yes, I'm here. I'm very much here. Yeah. Okay, so you know, so maybe you know, there's some problem at the Amit end. So yeah. would you want to take it up like, you know, in terms of whether NIRS or any other modality or markers they're using for monitoring right. as the neurologies who shy away? Um, yes. Is there uh, a role? I would say good evening, everyone, and thanks for the kind opportunity. I think uh, considering the galaxy of uh, and the expertise of uh, people here, I think uh, Dr. Suman or that uh, APNHF team wanted some common men to be there among specialists. So that's where we uh, neurologists uh, come in. We know something about everything, but we don't know uh, uh, details about anything, to be uh, frank. Uh, so to, uh, uh, when we even this is actually uh, uh, this acute kidney injury uh, being something which is hardly clinically symptomatic, which we have to uh, look into in detail, especially only when we, uh, and we know the limitations of the urine output only. We just heard the fantastic previous lectures uh, as the diluting ability of the kidney is well developed. Hardly we can rely upon the urine output also. So we go more by uh, the parameter which is commonly available to us, which is a serum creatinine. Uh, some good things which have already been emphasized. Uh, it is not an, uh, uh, any actual value of creatinine that is uh, very important. We need to look into uh, so what is happening to the trend. So in which direction the creatinine is moving. So we need to have something like a baseline creatinine. And again, uh, so if we have multiple values available, the lowest value which is available earlier has to be considered as baseline. Out of the various criteria, uh, I think uh, the one which has been uh, widely accepted, at least for the sake of uniformity, uh, 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 is this modified uh, criteria. 
Mm-hmm. We are also mm-hmm. just uh, going ahead with this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, to answer your question right away, actually, uh, this uh, uh, we do know that to some extent it has its own limitations using uh, uh, creatinine. This is not an uh, ideal criteria because uh, we don't know uh, this has it's not gestation based. We don't see any value separately for term and uh, uh, term babies uh, here. So uh, uh, lots and lot of biomarkers are being put uh, forward. Uh, maybe and again we know that actually reflections in creatinine takes some time. They don't uh, get reflected immediately. For creatinine rise, it may take some uh, seventy-two hours. So biomarkers seem to come in handy, and uh, I think uh, there's a long list of biomarkers uh, available. But I don't know practically uh, how many neonatologists do have access to. Uh, uh, biomarkers. Uh, I don't have any access to biomarkers in my unit. So uh, I can also don't have any access to as them. Of now, only the KITCO uh, criteria is the one which is uh, doable and feasible for most new colleges in the country as of now. Again, NIRS for that matter, uh, I'm not sure how far the criteria is. Again, NIRS may give us some trends whether the, uh, so we are struggling with NIRS, uh, uh, even though it may have multiple applications. Uh, I'm not sure whether it is ready for a clinical tool for a neonatologist. No, uh, not yet. We can't. Um, we can't recommend its usage at this moment. And uh, you know that was the neonatology side of it. Like you know now, Dr. Uma, can you just uh, highlight some of the current uh, challenges and limitations in diagnosing and staging uh, the neonatal AKI? So, I think there are several challenges. Uh, to begin with, it. Uh, arises from the choice of our biomarkers. I don't think we have much of a choice there. We are, we've got urine output creatinine and we're stuck with it for a long time. As uh, Mangla mentioned also, creatinine is a functional marker. It's not telling you injury, which occurs much before function worsens. So it's a late marker. Up to 50% of your function has to be lost before it rises. Added to which, you have the physiology of the newborn, which is a dynamic physiology, unlike an older child who has achieved a steady state of GFR. Here, there's a day-to-day variation in the way the GFR increases from 20 ml to 40 ml within two weeks. And so the uh, it is, and that is reflected in the creatinine. And so which day you're seeing how, how much is that particular child's kidney maturing There'll be very inter-individual variations as well, which we have no clue about, which have not been studied in detail. What is the extent of this variation, which we could call normal? In addition, it depends on the methodology we use. Now, many places still use the old Jaffe's method of creatinine estimation, which also measures non-creatinine chromogens, which may be up to 20% of the total value. And in newborns, this non-creatinine chromogens may be even higher because you have hyperbilirubinemia, medication, so many other things which would give a positive reaction. So one needs to use more sensitive methods which are not detecting non-chromogen, non-creatinine chromogens. One of that is Jaffe's kinetic reaction, where the measurement is made in the early part when the reaction is only measuring creatinine and not at the end of the reaction when it measures everything. So that is one. And the most sensitive method we have is the enzymatic assay, where the immunohydrolysis uh, uh, changes the creatinine to break down products of ammonia, which can be very accurately measured by the current systems. And it has practically no false elevations, except for one or some chemical. So for neonates, I would say for all pediatric patients, we should be using enzymatic method. For neonates especially, it is very important to use enzymatic method because we are dealing with small values and small changes and dynamic changes. So that's about creatinine. And also we, uh, when we come to preterms, as Nivedita pointed out, the smaller children, uh, reabsorb creatinine in the first few days, which never occurs later on in life because creatinine is not reabsorbed. So your creatinine may go up instead of coming down postnatally. And it can cause confusion whether it's AKI or it is a normal phenomena. 
which is not always easy to distinguish. So the number of physiological and technical limitations in creatinine, but despite that, I think the creatinine trend, the use of enzymatic creatinine will help to give a little better the reliability in this whole process. And second part is the urine output. I'm not very convinced the criteria taken by KD go of less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour as stage one, which we use for older children, because of all that has been said before by Nivedita, that your extravascular fluid is high, your total body water is high, uh, you can dilute the urine, so you'll tend to pass a large amount of urine. So the normal urine output is a large urine output in a normal newborn, and all, more so in the preterm, after the first day or so of life. And so uh, even a 1.5 ml per kg per hour, anything less than that, would raise suspicion that this, is, this baby is not throwing out as much urine as we have. So when we, so I think the KD goes specific, but not sensitive. But due to lack of any other validated data, this is what we need to use now. But I think more work needs to come on this in the, not only in just newborn, but in different gestational ages of preterms. So as rightly pointed out, like, you know, there's like from neonatologist point of view, if you see you have a 600 gram baby or 500 gram baby, 0.5 ml is like 0.2 ml or 0.3 ml of urine, which never gets, you know, recorded also. It's, it's, it's a difficult proposition and I agree like there is a lack of a consensus, but right now this is the only one which is available uh, for us to use. Now, uh, so the, you know, and my next question goes to uh, Dr. Mangla. Uh, Dr. Mangla, like what are the short term and the long term implications of, of uh, AKI? Because we always uh, talk about AKI being present, but often ignored in neonatology and NICUs. So can you just highlight some of the short-term and the long-term outcomes, which can change if the child has additional AKI. Uh, thank you, sir. So, because uh, I think it's a very important uh, question, uh, which we often uh, uh, miss to notice. So, because uh, uh, as uh, neonatologists, we know that uh, when you're dealing with these very uh, fragile uh, preterm neonates, we do find a uh, lot of alterations in many organ systems, not just kidneys, that it, uh, that it is a little bit uh, in so many parameters, in so many ways, so many organ systems. So the question that will come to uh, the mind of uh, neonatology is, okay, this baby had some abnormalities in the creatinine, which settled maybe later for a period of time. Uh, does it matter to this baby in any way? Well, is it going to affect this baby uh, uh, in the short term and the long term? So that's the what is uh, very surprising when you look into the data. So shown here on the slide uh, is the data from a large study. Uh, this, uh, they just looked into the very important parameter, just look into mortality. So uh, it's very, very surprising that even when you look into a very hard outcome like death, so uh, even for, uh, so if you look into the adjusted dot, the difference, actual difference uh, is something between something like 9.2 or 9.3 percent, uh, this is less than 2 percent, 1.8 percent between the babies who had AKN and who did not have uh, AKI. And uh, obviously there could have been so many parameters which could have influenced uh, uh, death. In, uh, so the best parameter what we settle for we all know we go for adjustments for various parameters even after adjusting for various known parameters which might have caused more death in the children who maybe might have been more sick uh, we uh, this number odds ratio 4.6 what you have you have the confidence interval is uh, uh, so uh, there is a strong reason to believe that uh, aki in babies is associated with uh, more uh, deaths it is associated with high mortality and of course, not only mortality, it has been shown the duration of ventilation, duration of hospital stay, those outcomes also have been uh, found to be uh, higher, higher uh, hospitals. And uh, when followed up, uh, interestingly, for a uh, long time, uh, so uh, these uh, renal injuries seem to persist for a longer time. So these children, when they are followed up in a later age, five years and beyond, I think most of the data is uh, when they've been followed up beyond five years. So many of them developed to uh, show features of uh, chronic renal dysfunction, mainly in terms of having abnormal blood pressures. They start seem to be start, uh, start showing uh, leak of proteins in urine and uh, uh, proteinurias. 
and the renal impairment uh, seems to uh, happen uh, in them over a longer period. So, uh, in, uh, in, in short, acute kidney injury seems to be a risk factor for development of a chronic uh, kidney dysfunction in the uh, later part. Uh, that's definitely a worrisome thing. And the uh, other one thing that apart from the chronic uh, injury that might happen to the kidney, uh, there's some data to show both in uh, the acute and in the chronic, uh, there are some associations. Uh, how much it is causative, I'm not sure. But definitely there are some associations in terms of uh, something related to the brain and the lungs. Uh, this could have been related to the fluid overload that happens in an acute uh, kidney injury, maybe secondary to that. So these, because we know the fluid status is a very important thing, status when you talk about incidents of intraventricular hemorrhage. So uh, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage uh, incidence seems to be a bit more in babies who had an ATI. Again, in, even the subgroup of babies who are having asphyxia, there are more MRI changes, abnormal MRIs in babies who have had uh, acute uh, kidney. <laughs> in the perspective of the lung, we know that again, uh, it may be because of so many things, but could be related directly to the fluid management, uh, or also fluid balance also. There is an increased, uh, we already uh, discussed about the need for longer duration of ventilation. In preterm uh, neonates, it seems it is a factor which is associated with an increased incidence of uh, BPD. One small study uh, shows that actually, which had evaluated the neurodevelopmental function at two years, there is a small amount of data to caution us, even the long term neuro impairment, maybe a little bit by babies who had uh, KK. So these are the main short term and long term concerns for neonatologists. Uh, in so is, AKI is certainly not an innocent bystander. Uh, and uh, as we have just learned in the last couple of slides is that, you know, just the mere presence of uh, AKI, even if it is uh, non uric uh, renal failure, does tend to have a long-term implication. And, you know, we as neonatologists always talk about a neurodevelopmental uh, follow-up, and we are so worried about uh, brain, but we hardly ever I mean, uh, check uh, for a blood pressure at one year of age or even an albumin uh, in the urine, which could be like a marker of a further progression to a, a chronic kidney disease. And this is something which is generally recommended by KIDCO also that we need to be looking at a serum creatinine if there was a child who had a severe AKI. And at least blood pressure and albumin is something that you need to check for at one year in case the child is like uh, had any evidence of AKI, even if he had recovered completely in the, in the short term. Now, like we always uh, have dealt in, in terms of, uh, you know, respiratory distress, HMD and other things, and any newborn conference would end up, it would start with a respiratory symposium, maybe go on to uh, PDF. And often, as I said, like off late, there have been some uh, symposia give time to neonatal <laughs> kids also. But uh, what is the incidence of uh, AKI in NICU? Uh, Amit, can you take take this up, please? Yeah, if we one is it is difficult to uh, define as such. Um, many AKIs are undetected, and uh, <clears throat> so the incidence otherwise in NICU has been reported to be as wide as from about one percent to about uh, twenty to twenty five percent. So there is a wide variation which has been um, uh, reported and it is basically so wide because uh, it is difficult to uh, diagnose and uh, definitely say, okay, this baby has AKI. So this is what uh, I would say the incidence between 1 to 25 percent. Yeah, so it's certainly not less like, you know, considering the fact that we are dealing with much smaller babies nowadays in neonatal and NICUs. So uh, uh, something which is the incidence of 25 to 30 percent is virtually affecting every second or third, uh, every third baby. And which means that we need to learn more about uh, the management of these babies. And in one of the largest uh, uh, studies we did was an awakened trial to begin with when looked at uh, a multicentric trial. And they found uh, uh, that almost 30 percent incidence of AKI and surprisingly, like the, the session was uh, was uh, statistication, 22 to 29 weeks, uh, the incidence was quite high. Almost half of the babies had some evidence of AKI. And uh, the term babies definitely had a, a higher incidence of uh, AKI compared to babies between 29 to 36 weeks. But that is understandable because 36 weeks babies would get into the NHQ for some of the sick reasons, like whether it's asphyxia, meconium, or anything. 
most babies many babies between 29 to 36 weeks uh, which are in the moderate uh, you know preterm group those are the ones who may have just mild uh, respiratory distress and and get well without being sick but substantially 30% is a quite a number that we need to look at and often you know we as neonatologists are not aware that many children could have uh, uh, many of our babies because we uh, do not routinely incidence match. would also vary as per what what type of uh, nic you run it will more in extramural babies if you have uh, if you receive sick babies from outside it will be lower in intramural babies in which uh, you are saving or salvaging predominantly about 28 week babies so if you cater to very sick babies the incidence of um, aki would be much more so uh, i mean to answer that question like you know this uh, particular awakened study this was uh, 24 centers across us which deals with uh, and india and argentina and uh, one more country four countries uh, and um, most of them had inborn uh, babies uh, and uh, the incidence was 30. And when we looked at an Indian cohort of babies, uh, which many of them had outborn, the incidence was more or less similar. So, I mean, it's like what I'm saying is that just, just because you're dealing with sick babies, surely you're going to have a higher incidence of uh, babies who are sick. But when you are largely an Um, uh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, Amit, uh, in the same time, uh, would you want to talk something about uh, the risk factors and uh, maybe the etiological causes of neonatal AKI, I understand you have to leave. Uh, for yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to talk about uh, the causes. So, the causes of AKI in newborns can be classified as into prenatal causes. And in prenatal causes would be the risk factors which are there and the antenatal period. For example, which is not uncommon is maternal intake of ACE inhibitors or some NSAIDs and uh, uncontrolled diabetes in mothers severe oligohydramnios or polyhydramnios and uh, one which we commonly face is eye drops vitalis, irrespective of cause, be it RH incompatibility or uh, a cardiac cause. And if uh, there is anti high drops, these babies are at high risk of um, renal failure after birth. If we look at congenital renal diseases, then the renal agenesis is a common cause. And not common, but... Uh, if renal failure is irreversible, then renal agenesis is one of them. Renal dysplasia, PCKDs, congenital nephrotic syndrome, these all are rare ones, but you do encounter uh, if you are at a big referral center. Then most important which we face is postnatal causes of AKI. And uh, it can be classified into pre-renal and intrinsic renal failure. So pre-renal is also quite common. And if you have perinatal hemorrhage, loss of blood volume is there. Then, or if you have significant dehydration, irrespective of the cause of dehydration, whether it is due to diarrhea, if it is because of uh, insen excessive insensible water losses, because of poor intake, third space losses like um, if, uh, there is gastroschisis and bowel is exposed, chest tube losses could be there, GI losses could be there, capillary leak, secondary to um, hypoalbuminemia or septicemia, CHF. So these are common causes of pre-renal uh, causes which lead to um, AKI or oliguria in newborns. Then there could be postnatal uh, um, or intrinsic renal causes in which uh, perinatal asphyxia or ischemia would account for most common uh, causes of um, uh, asphyxia. Drug-induced is also not uncommon. And uh, they are commonly uh, nephrotoxic drugs, which are there like aminoglycosides if used in inappropriate doses for a long day. Especially if multiple drugs are combined together, like aminoglycoside with vancomycin. And uh, especially if these two are on and you give some dye for uh, some dye study in this baby, that cause also, can also cause problems. Renal vascular thrombosis, uh, they are not uncommon. Both renal arteries, um, thrombosis and vein thrombosis can lead to failure. 
and um, contrasts they if radio contrasts are given they can lead to renal shutdown if there is already some prenatal or perinatal compromise in the gut is there then uh, our uh, old friend sepsis is a common cause and uh, uh, sepsis due to uh, gram negative or even fungal infections so these are intrinsic causes of uh, renal failure which are there but we should never forget uh, obstructive causes or post renal causes as they are called for renal failure they are also quite common in newborns and uh, uh, puv or postnatal valve is a common cause uh, especially if there is a solitary kidney then obstruction in that solitary kidney is uh, a, a, a common cause neurogenic bladder uh, can result into uh, post renal failure so i would say these are the common causes of uh, uh, renal failure in newborns and one uh, would be wary of um, uh, if there are some risk factors one should be actively screening for decreasing urine output and uh, avoid them into going into complete renal shutdown and returning from there is often very difficult so what you know <laughs> when we looked at uh, you know or around 2000 babies and looked at what are the risk factors you know there were some surprising points and that's why i put it here like you know uh the decreased risk was associated with multiple gestation cesarean section rate uh methyl xanthines diuretics and uh, vasopressor now for some reason like this is slightly like you know intriguing uh, that the use high bilirubin was associated with increased risk possibly and these are just associations these are not causation i'm just like you know looking we looked at the risk factors and one of the other things that which was interesting to note high bilirubin and, uh, can be association because uh, high bilirubin also uh, can be there in dehydration uh, yes, body is just, just, that's one thing like you know we probably in fact it, in one it, of the other thai, taiwanese study use of a prophylactic nsaids which we often blame for uh, the renal failure or the renal injury was associated with lesser risk of uh, you know declining ati rates now like again these are just again as i said risk factors do not associate causation but these are some of the interesting fact to to study further when it comes to uh, finding about uh, the risk factors for for uh, you know in neonatal ati and uh, most cases are etiologically are related to as you already said their presence of uh, vlbw babies it is very high birth is 6 years high in genital heart disease the incidence is around 40 to 50% almost you go to some of the cardiac units they will be regularly dialyzing every other child and ecmo of course in india is not practiced neonatal ecmo but again becomes a very high risk factor now uh, i come to you dr uma for uh, you know everybody gets worried now we understood that probably we need to get worried about uh, the aki is there a way for us to predict uh, that this child is likely to go into into aki and i need to be a little bit more cautious about it see i think they it's like searching for the holy grail a predictive factor and so um one of the ones in the last decade which we had which we still have is the renal angina index which we have used for older children etc where you have two categories first you identify whether they fall into the risk criteria these are largely defined for children rather than neonates which include risks include admission to icu itself solid organ or stem cell transplantation and anybody who's on mechanical ventilation and inotropic support and signs of injury renal injury in which you're looking at serum creatinine and you're also looking at a fluid uh, overload so that fluid overload is a fairly sensitive marker over time which we which has been seen that if you have a fluid overload of uh, depending on 5 to 10% 10 to 15 more than 15 each level has a scoring for the creatinine for fluid overload so you multiply your score of the risk criteria with the score of the injury taking your creatinine and fluid output into consideration and if you have a score more than 8 you are at risk of developing aki in the next 72 hours and this renal angina index is assessed 
uh, somewhere between eight to 12 hours after admission, after we, it's presumed we've corrected all the prerenal factors, hypertension, et cetera, by this time. So this didn't, uh, is a good uh, 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 thing because it's at the bedside. And uh, so it can be done anywhere by anybody. It doesn't need any special test. But its uh, predictive value was not very high. It was somewhere around 0.76 in the area under the curve. And some uh, studies have used this along with urinary biomarkers when the predictive value became even better to 0.84, et cetera. So I think we're still uh, in the lookout for it, but this is something that we can use in older children. I'm not sure whether the same applies to neonates. And agree, agreed because uh, we looked at uh, renal injury. Definitely, there are some of the parameters which are not even relevant for uh, newborns like solid right. cell uh, transplantation. Uh, so, uh, you know, as a part of a study group that we looked at, uh, you know, whether we could devise any kind of a neonatal AKRS stratification scoring as uh, uh, among the Indian cohort of uh, babies we studied here in India. And uh, we looked at uh, the scoring system where we had uh, almost 10 parameters to look at and uh, based on, on the risk uh, of AKI in individual, we probably looked at a score and in a score, uh, which was uh, more than 31 was suggestive of an AKI. So there is a calculator which is available on the net on the website, or you could probably calculate it uh, yourself based on, on the scores which have been given and uh, this one has a, a positive predictive value of 80% uh, and, and interestingly had a negative predictive value of almost 95% uh, for a score of 30, 31.5. So that was, uh, uh, you know, kind of interesting for us. And if somebody wants to use the score, this is something that we can help in identifying which babies are likely to go into, uh, you know, AKI, and you could be a little bit more cautious about uh, the use of uh, vespressors or NSAIDs or even antimicrobial, which have an ephrotoxic, uh, you know, implication. And in the in the same study, which we looked at a urine which was less than one point four, although KDO guidelines says less than 0. 0.5, but less than one point four or a serum creatinine rise in the first 12 hours was an ominous sign which resulted in a very high uh, score. And uh, when we looked at uh, the same score and need for peritoneal dialysis, again, the score was like somewhere around more than 59, had almost 71% uh, sensitivity to find out which babies had severe AKI and a score of more than 66 had almost sensitivity of 97%. Uh, for a peritoneal dialysis use. Now, with this score, what, what uh, we recommend is that, like, you know, if you have a score as high as this one, you either need to get in touch with an pediatric nephrologist uh, sooner, even if you do not need a peritoneal dialysis right away, or shift the child to a center where the, uh, the facility for at least further renal support is available for, uh, for uh, children. So now you come to, we did a validation again. So let's come to the next uh, question. I have, uh, you know, for you, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Uma. Now we we also had uh, albumin looking at in one of the vacant groups and then looked at uh, for every 0.1 gram decrease in albumin, the odds of late AKI increased by 12%. Similarly, when you looked at a low hemoglobin, um, we found out that the neonates uh, who were having a low hemoglobin was associated with neonatal AKI, but uh, this was probably related to a low fluid rather than to an absolute value of hemoglobin. So just because you have a low hemoglobin, uh, maybe putting you at a risk of AKI, but uh, you know that if you control for the fluid, maybe you don't need to transfuse that baby just for prevention of AKI. And in another uh, paper we just uh, pub uh, published recently, uh, the use of furosemide was associated with increased risk of uh, death uh, among the babies who were 
uh, having an AKI. And this is surprising because most of us end up using furosemide whenever the child has an AKI and we use multiple doses. We were not able in this paper to look at how many doses of furosemide was dangerous because there was no data available on that. But certainly, you know, furosemide uh, left, right and center may be harmful to babies with neonatal AKI. Uh, now, uh, another question for you, Dr. Uma. Is this, is this uh, prevention possible? Like, you know, can we look at, uh, you know, some ways we can prevent AKI from happening in the first place? And, uh, and since Mayul is not there, maybe uh, you could also take up a baby ninja study, which is, you know, based on an older children ninja study. Yeah, I, I think the prevention, you know, we have as um, a neonatal group always focused on neuroprotection and lung protection. And we have looked at, we have not really thought about the kidney and treated it as an excretory organ, which will do what it wants. And we have also not paid uh, or even done creatinins in the past as, you know, till all this information did not come about so strongly. So I think the thought of preventing renal injury perhaps is lowest in the mind of neonatologists as I perceive it, I may be wrong. Hmm? No, you're right. So I, I think you need to look at it first, right from the time the baby is born, because this baby is a vulnerable baby. This kidney is not a healthy kidney. Health, it's a healthy kidney, even in a full-term newborn. If you see 20 ml per minute GFR, that's the cutoff we use for diagnosing stage 5 CKD in an older child. So that means that function is that low that if it was in an older child, we would have said this child is in the entering the last stage of CKD. And we would be extremely careful with everything we do. So we have to treat this child same way that this child has as low a GFR as a, a CKD patient. And if it's a preterm, it's even more vulnerable because the nephrogenesis is not complete. So they are even more vulnerable. So you have a very vulnerable kidney here. So it needs extra care that you don't harm it. The common things we can do, of course, besides uh, prevention of uh, other perinatal events, is you fluids that we don't underhydrate, but we also should be careful that we don't overhydrate and cause fluid overload. So fluids play a very important part of what we are doing. And second would, important thing would be the drugs we are using. Because ultimately, all a good number of drugs are excreted by the kidney through various mechanisms. Either they are filtered, they are secreted. Many of them are reabsorbed. And these immature tubules are prone to injury by many medications which we have been using. So if I have to just put it down to two things, I would put your fluids and your medications should receive a lot of attention in uh, when you're handling these babies. Yeah, and certainly we'll come to use of caffeine and, uh, and uh, theopaline in some time. And mm -hmm. uh, baby ninja study, which was nephrotoxin induced, uh, negated by just-in-time action, was uh, a kind of a quality improvement study which was done in one of the hospitals in uh, US. Uh, and they looked at babies who were given more than three nephrotoxic medications within 24 hours or more than four calendar uh, days of uh, IV aminoglycoside. And if that was proven, then they were given daily creatinine you know, monitoring uh, and that ended two days after the end of the exposure or end of AKI, whichever occurred last. And uh, so they had three epochs where they had uh, baseline creatinine modified and then after sustained uh, effect, during this, uh, you know, monitoring, uh, whenever they had uh, this thing, they showed a reduction in the percentage of nephrotoxic medication uh, decrease from 30% to almost uh, 11% and a reduction in AKI intensity from 9, 9 uh, uh, to almost 3 per 100 susceptible patient days uh, while maintaining a high uh, serum creatinine surveillance rate. Which means that, like you know, if your child is on on um, some kind of a nephrotoxic medicine, especially a combination which Amit was just mentioning, vancomycin and uh, some other aminoglycoside as well, 
in that scenario, it may be a good idea for you to monitor the serum creatinine and modify the use of nephrotoxic. Once you start monitoring, the unit also gets a little bit more, uh, you know, aggressive about about uh, preventing that injury. And it's something one of the easiest ways is to monitor daily and daily, you know, serum creatinine in babies. Now I have a question like for uh, Mangla. Mangla, like you know, caffeine and theophylline. We all know the caffeine has so much of benefit, and uh, including the, the neurodevelopment, the, the BPD prevention, PDA reduction, all those things. It also has been shown to reduce the the incidence of ATI if used in, in the first seven days. And the risk of late ATI, what I'm talking about. And if you use it very early, also the incidence of you know stage two and stage three AKI was also reduced. In uh, one of the meta analysis which was published by uh, Akash, also Akash Pandita, they said uh, theophylline use uh, has been associated with sixty percent reduction in severe kidney dysfunction in severe birth asphyxia. Now Kidgo supports the use of uh, this uh, you know guidelines. But somehow, as neurologists, we are very wary of using this recommendation, and we would never, even ever lectures kind of uh, mention this. Can you want to give any comment on that? Uh, so thank you, sir. Uh, I think as far as caffeine is concerned, uh, as rightly pointed out uh, by you, it's one of our magic bullets, obviously. So we know uh, it helps uh, not only the lung; it helps the brain also. But uh, this is, uh, I think, the third information is. Uh, 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 oh, my perspective is that uh, the dissemination of the fact that actually uh, the subgroup analysis of uh, the uh, awakened data which had been published showing that babies who had received caffeine uh, had a significantly decreased incidence of uh, uh, AKI. Uh, having said that, uh, so, so that uh, I, I, there's no doubt that there is a theoretical basis how things might work. We know that uh, so this is an adenosine uh, uh, antagonist. So obviously, it will help in better uh, blood flow to the kidney and improvement of uh, GFR. But this is not from an, any uh, interventional uh, study. This is an observational data where actually we are looking into babies who have been started on caffeine for some other reason, not for uh, uh, prevention of uh, AKA. And so caffeine has been started at multiple time points. Some had received caffeine earlier. Some had received caffeine after the baby developed AKA. The indications for starting caffeine in these babies uh, may be different. And that indication might be one of the factors which may be associated with acute kidney injury. But there is no reason for a neonatologist, I think, to do away from caffeine when you're talking about preterm babies. That's a drug which you use right and left. It's good to know that it, is, it decreases the incidence of AKA also. So again, that will be a very strong factor to bring in caffeine in the management of preterm babies. About theophylline, sir, I think once caffeine came in, I think the Hesitation may be because of the fact that uh, we all know we were all very comfortable in using aminophylline and theophylline left and right before caffeine came in. And we replaced uh, uh, theophylline and aminophylline with caffeine because of the various adverse events of these drugs related to the other systems, especially the effect of this uh, these drugs on the uh, sympathetic uh, system and the adverse effects uh, associated with those drugs. Uh, so uh, that's why we are more comfortable with caffeine than theophylline. But this data, I think multiple RCTs, say uh, more than six or seven RCTs, where we're talking about a single dose of theophylline given at least to the subgroup of babies with asphyxia, uh, showing that uh, that a single dose of theophylline in babies with birth asphyxia leads to a decrease in AKI. That's something that uh, uh, we can't ignore and we should give a lot of focus. And uh, personally, I think I'll be using theophylline in babies with uh, uh, birth asphyxia to decrease the incidence of AKI. Yeah, so, you know, in my lectures also, I see, especially if you are dealing with the asphyxia in a peripheral center and you don't have a facility for hypothermia uh, and you do not have a facility for a pediatric nephrologist nearby, I say this one dose of theophylline may not be as harmful as we generally have made it out to be in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. And especially with understanding that caffeine has a long-term neurodevelopmental uh, benefit also at two years you know possibly uh, you know we we one of the con one of the hesitations about using caffeine we do not have a long term neuro uh, sorry theophylline that we do not have a neurodevelopmental outcome available 
may be also mitigated by the fact that caffeine has a has proven to be a good neuroprotective at two years as well. Now, uh, Dr. Uma, like, you know, we come to the next, how do you decide about uh, uh, when to initiate kidney replacement therapy in children? And, uh, you know, in the same time, I would also want you to go through slightly about the advantages and disadvantages of different modalities of kidney replacement therapies in units like peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, or continuous renal replacement. Yeah. So first, to the thing that when do we decide on dialysis? Uh, it's interesting, although the AKI incidence seems to be very high in neonates, the need for dialysis is comparatively low. So only about 4% of children who go get into AKI often need dialysis. And the indications are more or less similar to what we would do in older children. So one would be, of course, your biochemical uh, derangements like high severe hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, because you can't go on giving bicarb to these small babies. Uh, it's also complicated, further complicated if this is associated with oliguria, because you need to give the baby nutrition. And so you need enough what we call fluid space so that you'll be able to give adequate nutrition to the child and whatever other supports, medications, et cetera, the baby may need. So if your urine output is less or you're getting fluid overloaded despite a reasonable output, then also you would need to have dialysis on. So amongst the dialysis modalities which we have, the one, two which are used for newborns are peritoneal dialysis, most widely used, and second, CRRT. Hemodialysis is difficult to use in newborns. In the Indian setup, it's not even logistically feasible because we don't get the right size disposables for newborns. So the extracorporeal circuit becomes too large, so you would need to use blood prime. And then when you're using such a large extracorporeal circuit, it's also very difficult to remove fluid. So if one of your goals was to remove some fluid because child is fluid overloaded, your HD is not going to work well, besides a lot of problems and feasibility. Uh, so the most widely used is PD because of its simplicity. Uh, large peritoneal surface area compared to body surface area in newborns, so good uh, dialyzing membrane. And uh, a kind of a low-cost intervention as well. And very gentle, so safe to use in newborns. It won't produce any rapid shifts. So it has been the most widely used methodology. Uh, the second one is CRRT, which is uh, a little center dependent if they would like to use CRRT as your initial modality. Most centers would use CRRT uh, in our setups where PD is not feasible or uh, PD is not working well, like, or, you know, you have an abdominal surgery, you have a diaphragmatic hernia as an underlying cause and you can't do PD. In that case, you use CRRT. Now, even in CRRT, what we have available with us is the Prismaflex and the HF20 dialyzer. And it is not really approved for use below 8 kg weight. So it's not really a newborn recommendation, but still because we do not have a dedicated newborn CRRTs in India, we do with a lot of other adjustments and adaptations, the HF20 membrane for pediatric uh, CRRT. We do have in other parts of the world evolving CRRTs where the extracorporeal circuit is very small. In general principle of extracorporeal therapies, the volume outside the body should not exceed 10% of your blood volume or 8% of your body weight. If it's more than that, it will cause hemodynamic instability, even in an otherwise stable patient. And if your patient is not stable, which is what will happen in an uh, NICU setup, even this, if it's uh, even this much, it may cause instability while the blood is coming out of the body and would require priming often with blood. 
So these uh, newer CRRT machines like Carpedium, invented by Ronco, and the NIDIS, which is made in UK, they have very small extracorporeal volumes, you know. So one has hardly some 12 ml of extracorporeal volume. So very ideally suited for very safe, gentle CRRT in newborns. But they are not yet readily available all over the world. Only a few centers use them as of now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so one of the comments, see, we, we understand uh, that some children would require adrenal replacement therapy. But could you just also uh, tell us, uh, for the sake of neonatologists, what are the potential problems that we can also see infection, leakage, and other things? What are the potential problems when we start see children? The, oh, see, in PD, it starts right from your catheter insertion, depending on what catheter you're using. Formally, we would use mostly the stiff catheter, so which has a potential for injury because of the trocar, which is very sharp and big, which uh, penetrates the abdominal wall and goes in. So you have to be very careful. Having said that, I mean, many pediatric nephrologists have learned from that and have used it safely. But other which you could use are the soft catheter, which can be left inside the abdomen for a longer period. And uh, some innovated catheters, which are not meant to be PD catheters, but which are used like the Ronson's drain, et cetera, which have been used and they're softer and can remain in and can be introduced with a small nick or by sending us technique, et cetera. So one is injury to the other organs. Generally, to prevent that, we create an artificial ascites and then insert the catheter. So the intestines are floating and they don't get fixed by anything penetrating there. The other important thing which you can have uh, technically mechanical problems is leak, which is very, very disturbing because it's very difficult to rectify. And one reason for the leak is when you take a bigger nick than what is needed for the diameter of the catheter. So you have to take a small nick in the abdomen wall, which just snugly fits in the PD catheter and not a good generous one centimeter nick, which you then suture up because it will keep leaking. And once you're leaking, you have inefficient dialysis, you will not be able to give good volumes, and you're also prone to infections. The third important one is the potential for infection. <clears throat> so this is going in, coming out. Once you start, you may be following all aseptic precautions, but subsequently it's handled by the nurse. <laughs> so depending on the kind of system you're using, it could be a fully closed system or it may be like a semi-closed system where every time you're disconnecting, connecting with the bottle. So every time the bottle of catheter is handled, it has to be again by the nurse with full aseptic precautions, etc. <clears throat> and the fourth is mechanical where you have poor drainage. Your fluid is going in, but your fluid is not coming out in the same way. And that is, again, uh, could relate to the position of your catheter, whether you placed it rightly. So immediately after placing, it's very important to give rapid fluid in and out without a dwell time to ensure that the position you placed it in gives you a good drainage. If it's substandard drainage, don't accept it. It's worth spending half an hour more getting it right. Otherwise, you'll never be able to sleep full night. You'll get calls for this, that it's not draining. Uh, another reason is that sometimes it is abutting against the abdominal wall or some organ, and so the holes are blocked. And many times there's an omental wrap. The omentum is a little large and fleshy in smaller children. And it may stick to the catheter pores and not allow drainage. So fluid goes in, but doesn't come out that easily. So sometimes, of course, you can have kinks and other things, my catheter migration, et cetera, which may cause poor drainage. So there are four or five important causes, and one would have to analyze what is causing and rectify it. So uh, important point, which uh, Dr. Omar mentioned that it is a procedure which can help the child, but also is fraught with certain dangers. So it's not as simple as putting in a cannula into the abdomen 
and you need a little bit of an expertise and you should uh, as neonatologists go and and attend some workshops on how to do peritoneal dialysis like how to put it on catheter and in case in case you do not have a facility and you don't have the expertise uh, of a pediatric nephrologist available you can ask a pediatric surgeon that's what we tend to do mostly that we ask the pediatric surgeon to put in a catheter uh, if uh, our pediatric nephrologist is, is on leave and uh, and i would recommend that like you know i would suggest uh, to iip to organize uh, some kind of a workshop by dr uma and other uh, nephrologists to to teach neonatologists the, the facets of of peritoneal dialysis uh, easily now uh, you know having come to that one of the other things that we use in neonatology is furosemide whenever we have a child and as i earlier mentioned that use of furosemide in the in the tinker registry that we we were going through we found that the use of furosemide was associated with increased risk of mortality now i would not make a direct association between furosemide and mortality but what i would suggest uh, because this was just an observational uh, data uh, but what i would suggest that using multiple doses of furosemide may not be beneficial and may be harmful so if you want to use furosemide once maybe yes if it doesn't work don't use it more than once if you if you have uh, kind of unlike in in older children they start with one and two and then go up to 10 maybe it may not be that beneficial in in smaller baby uh now like uh, coming to the last uh, part of the surgical part now we have a gamut of uh, reasons why and we talked about uh, cacut or the uh, kidney abnormalities which are there one of the commonest uh, problems which uh, we face as neonatologists and we have to kind of uh, answer the parents is an antenatal hydronephrosis and not only we have ans to answer the parents we also have to answer the gynecologists at time now uh, my question to you mangla is that you know in fetus uh, you get a report saying that there is a fetal hydronephrosis and uh, now how do you approach that like you know from the point of view of uh, you know during pregnancy and what are the indications for fetal interventions or early delivery if indicated yes sir as rightly pointed out by you sir it's one of the very common uh, uh, issues that come to us uh, for opinions and for antenatal uh, uh, counseling and but uh, we know that actually a very large proportion of them are going to be uh, uh, just where you just wait observe and uh, keep a close watch on what is happening over a period of time and i'll say uh, hardly we come across situations where an uh, intervention will be required in the antenatal period uh, there are various ways uh, we know that uh, people try to uh, classify the extent of uh, this dilatation that happens uh, within the uh, kidney uh, of the we you know that there some uh, we do get some measurements uh, done by the ap diameter uh, uh, and then uh, there are uh, systems like the fetal uh, urology society where the grades are uh, based upon uh, whether uh, there is just playing then involvement of only uh, major calluses the minor calluses also start getting dilated involvement of the parenchyma and the recent utd system where various numbers have been given for the uh, utd uh, this helps us to understand actually uh, in what stage it is like whether it is uh, in the very uh, early stage or is it in an uh, advanced stage uh, so uh, so uh, as a clinician sir i'll be interested more in uh, interested rather than actually looking into the number or the grade uh, i'll be just asking three important questions first is that actually am i dealing with a problem only on one side or am i dealing with a problem on both sides is it unilateral or uh, bilateral and uh, is there any involvement of uh, the bladder is there any distension of the bladder in the ultrasound that has been uh, given and what is happening to the liquor status is the liquor uh, remaining normal and especially in uh, follow up ultrasounds or do we have any reason to believe that uh, this fetus uh, start showing uh, features of uh, renal dysfunction in form of uh, oliguria and the, maybe uh, to say one more the fourth consideration will be am i dealing with an isolated problem in terms of an, this hydronephrosis alone or is it possible this could be a part of a syndrome where this baby can have uh, problems in the other systems whether a detailed look had been looked into the various other organs obviously the prognosis of that baby will turn out to be different so uh, coming to uh, we'll focus only on an uh, isolated uh, hydrocephalus uh, for the moment uh, so unless it is a bilateral associated with the bladder uh, uh, 
distension and causing uh, oliguria progressively especially so mostly we'll just say we'll advise only repeat ultrasonograms and uh, so uh, it, it will not require any uh, intervention in the antenatal period we will recommend continuing the pregnancy till term just uh, keeping a watch only for uh, these parameters obviously the evaluation will happen uh, postnatal we know that uh, the interventions some interventions uh, surgical interventions are available uh, in the uh, fetal period uh, so of the various interventions i think uh, i don't want to go into the details for the sake of time but the one that is uh, uh, performed at least as of now we do see that's happening is a shunt the vesico amniotic shunt hardly we do see direct fetal interventions fulgurations of puvs or those interventions i think are hardly practiced now they have been found to be more invasive and harmful to the fetus but even for this intervention the vesico amniotic shunt uh, so there seems to be various uh, schools of thought about uh, the usefulness of doing this procedure in the intrauterine period Uh, so what we know uh, for sure like that actually uh, this uh, creating a shunt and ensuring the uh, relieving the obstruction and maintaining uh, the amniotic fluid to flow and uh, uh, avoiding this uh, uh, what to say effects of uh, less liquor or uh, uh, going to the extent of it can even lead go to anhydramnias there is, seems to be definite benefit in terms of uh, development of the lung and other factors which uh, may lead to a survival of the baby which may have an impact on the survival but people seem to have different opinions about uh, the impact of doing this shunt on the uh, really on the renal function whether you are doing a vesico amniotic shunt does it alter the course of uh, uh, the renal impairment that's likely to happen over a period of time there seems to be different schools of thought uh, at least i'll say in this line so we will be considering a, an intervention like a shunt only in a very very rare circumstances where there is something like uh, again where where there is a severe renal dysfunction in terms of a severe uh, oliguria that too will uh, will be considering this only in a early gestation like somewhere between uh, if it is only between 20 weeks to say up to 32 weeks where we want the fetus again to be there we want to buy time for this baby to come out if it is a baby is more than say 34 and all uh, so rather than going for a fetal intervention uh, if it is a severe uh, Uh, deficiency for liquor will con- that's the only situation where we will consider an early delivery going to the extent of something like an no liquor at all and then uh, it endangers the baby survival will consider an early delivery but uh, bearing those rare exceptions mostly it's a wait and watch game and the evaluation happens uh, postnatal yeah it's important to see uh, you know we I, i have a baby in the follow up where we did uh, in the part of uh, because that child had bilateral hydronephrosis had puv oligodermos and uh, the bladder tap showed a good prognostic case and like because it was repeating uh, oligodermos so the vesico amniotic shunt was put and the baby delivered at term and now is doing excellent so i mean like you know rightful selection of cases may also be important at talking to a fetal uh, person may be of value in such cases now dr uh, das has been uh, the pediatric surgeon he's been uh, really silent because you know surgical we always call the surgeons when we are in dire need and uh, i want you to talk about uh, dr uh, you know das about uh, what uh, do how do you evaluate uh, the babies with antenatal hydronephrosis after birth what are the indications for imaging what are the functional tests or even prophylaxis that we some people are very keen on antibiotic prophylaxis can you show some uh, throw some light on that please dr kanishka yeah yeah uh, yes i i would just uh, like to add uh, to what dr mangla bharat said about the antenatal uh, antenatal counseling besides all that he he mentioned there are one or two things that uh, that are extremely important besides the one we detect that there is an anomaly it is a 4 to 6 weeks repeat review that we do and we may need to recounsel them based on the status which is dynamic which is not static very often you see some of them having an ultrasound once and then not following up after that so the trend is important rather than one um, ultrasound and as you said there is hardly any role for any uh, substantial antenatal intervention the timing the indication the window therapeutic window in which it helps actually pulmonary maturity and whether it takes um it helps in any long term all of it is controversial 
for all practical purposes, it is, it is something which is uh, still not a proven benefit and cannot be sort of shelved out to be used in common clinical use. It's a very, very select indication that uh, one goes in for an antenatal thing. And for the large part of therapy, it is uh, counseling and counseling and postnatal early evaluation, delivery at a tertiary center in utero transfer and postnatal early evaluation. So that is the status of uh, thing in large parts of our country with the health system, delivery system that we have. Now to come on to postnatal evaluation, if you had an antenatal diagnosis, you have a head start and you know that you can take it off right from postnatal onwards. Uh, in the evaluation. Here, just like Nivedita pointed out, that this neonatal period uh, is extremely important. And if you can, if we can get our answers in the first one month after birth, then we can get, get down to business as to how to manage this particular child with the cat So what are the things that we look at in the neonatal period? A primary thing is to, of course, rule out that it is not an infravesical obstruction, whether it is valves, posterior visceral valves, or the neurogenic bladder, as has been pointed out, being the two common ones which cause the problem. Or if it is something, a bilateral pathology, like a bilateral VUJ, which you commonly can get with both of these conditions, valves and neurogenic bladder, or bilateral VUR, the primary variety and the secondary variety, or if it is a solid kidney with any of these, again, that is a very high risk condition. So, or, so if it is any of these, then we have to be on a war footing right from the day, from the day of birth so as to get the investigations, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, in unilateral conditions, for most, one can, uh, one usually resorts to a um, profile axis initially, and we, let the profile axis be there till we get all our answers in the first uh, few days to weeks. What are the answers we are looking for? We are looking for, besides the general well-being of the border, of the baby and that the child is not in acute renal failure, et cetera, et cetera, in the initial period, we are looking at, is there a unilateral anomaly? Is there a bilateral anomaly? Is there an infravesical anomaly affecting both the systems? Is it reflux? Is it obstruction? or is it combinations of all these? And to answer these questions of ours, we always start with clinical examination, then go on to non-invasive imaging, like ultrasound, that's a common thing that we use. Then we go on to more invasive imaging depending on the indication. MCU, we all know and abhor as an invasive investigation. So we would like to avoid an MCU unless absolutely necessary. If we can wait for some time, come down the safe way from a renal cortical scan, we do it that way. We come back from a DMS scan down and then do the MCU. But of course, there are some indications in which we absolutely have to do the MCU in the, in the first few weeks to get an answer. When there is bilateral uh, ureteric dilatation, unilateral ureteric dilatation, uh, infravesical suspicion of infravesical obstruction, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this is the thought process that we have on the MCU after the non-invasive ultrasound. And then of course, the last stage of it is, is the uh, accurate functional assessment. And there we have a choice between two types of studies, a flow study, which is a diuretic renogram, which tells us about obstruction anywhere in any of the junction, right from the PUJ, VUJ down, or, the other study that we do is the renal cortical scan, which tells us about tubular function and uh, renal cortical uh, uh, scan. So, so these are the broad algorithm of studies that we choose depending on an individualized approach to a given patient. Yes, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and it's important something. that we have all these answers by a month or so, so that we go on to manage right from the word go and do not miss the first six months of life. And, uh, you know, yes. to answer the question about uh, prophylactic antibiotics, uh, antibiotics, which, uh, you know, often gets uh, prescribed to many, unless there is a dilated ureter or an enlarged bladder or like a bi uh, bilateral or a very massive 
uh, you know, hydronephrosis. A routine use in mild hydronephrosis or moderate hydronephrosis has not been proven to be of any major value uh, in terms of uh, prevention of infection. So that's something which as neonatologists, we tend to do and overdo at times. The last question for, for this, like again for you, Dr. Uh, das, is, uh, you know, uh, how do you like, you know, diagnose a prenatal diagnosis and staging of uh, posterior urethral valve? And uh, what is the, long, we're not talking about the surgery because that's your field, but as neurotologists, we need to counsel them about what are the long-term outcomes of PUV, even if you treat. So, because many people will leave that, like, you know, you do a PUV, a PUV resection and everything will be hunky-dory. Can you just throw a light on that, please? Yeah, there is uh, there is no antenatal staging or uh, thing of PUV, but of course there are many antenatal um, factors and observations that sort of can predict what the postnatal status is going to be. So, like we discussed before, if if you have bilateral urinary tract dilatation (UTD), so that compared to a unilateral urinary tract dilatation in a suspect PUV. Is, is more ominous. The unilateral one, the conventional wisdom is about the, that it is associated with VU or D valve unilateral deflux and dysplasia, which means that the other side is protected. And although there is a controversy there, most of the time the VU or D is actually a favorable factor and the other one, other kidney is well. So uh, factors like this in the antenatal ultrasound sort of give us a broad idea that one kidney is perfectly protected or not, or is it bilateral affliction? Obviously, bilateral affliction, whether it is obstruction reflux with PUV, would, would mean that it is going to be worse. Then, of course, the all-important um, uh, amniotic fluid volumes and the, uh, the um, uh, hydramni uh, oligohydramnios that goes with it, how bad it is. There was a time when one would rush to do the uh, fetal urine estimation, et cetera, et cetera, for all its values, and then try to do something based on that. So I, I don't think there are many of us who are uh, really excited by that because it really hasn't shown to be of much uh, clinical import. So these, and then of course, the antenatal trend that you see in the, in, the, uh, in the imaging is what gives you an idea of how bad this fetus is. Will it, is it going to Go till term, is it going to um, require some intervention for fear, uh, pulmonary maturity? Is it going to be a neonatal distress? And then, of course, as the uh, when the child is born, the rest of the things are uh, quite evident. So this is how we go about counseling them as to how bad a particular neonate of a suspect PUV can be and what are the long-term outcomes based on that. We will, of course, get a clear idea only after the child is born so very often, many of these prognostic factors, uh, you might have a very uh, a bad child with uh, oligohydramnios, uh, bilateral uh, leaking, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, uh, it might even turn around and then gradually become um, quite fine and not go on to uh, a CKD very early in life. So we have had several like this uh, surprises in our uh, pediatric nephro clinic at St. John's in the last 20 years. So there is really no set rule. But these are the broad outlines and guidelines that we go through to counsel them antenatally. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. And uh, as I uh, put up one slide that AKI increases your length of stay, the, the webinar on AKI would increase your length of stay on YouTube and on the Zoom. So I leave, leave it to the organizers and Dr. Rupas the baton back to Dr. Suman to carry the further proceedings. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, everyone. I think it was very, very interesting and educative. And like someone has put in the chat, yes, this will be available on our website, uh, the recording, so all of us can go back to it. But there are definitely, a, you know, we're not going to let you go because there are many questions in the chat. And also people have been raising their hands. Uh, so I invite the attendees who, who are here with us to, you can raise your hands now and we would invite you to ask your questions. But meanwhile, uh, Dr. Sanjay, can I request you to take the questions in the chat one by one? Uh, I think, 
So uh, some of them uh, have been uh, answered by Nivedita. That was the initial ones. So there's a question which has come up on what about effects of cow's milk if started by the family after discharge from the hospital? And I guess that is with relation to the risk factors. I think that must be in relation to late metabolic acidosis. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I think maybe because, but uh, that came in a little late. Okay, so we will leave that. Uh, this is, this is uh, a question by Dr. Gayatri. Please explain which medicines are nephrotoxic drugs to affect AKI. Yeah, Dr. Omar, you want to take it up? Please. Yeah, I think there are many nephrotoxic drugs which we are in daily use. Uh, one, to begin with, the oldest one is aminoglycosides. All aminoglycosides are nephrotoxic because they are reabsorbed by the proximal tubules, which are very vulnerable to injury at this age. Uh, other drugs would be like vancomycin, your NSAIDs if you're using it for PDA or some other purpose. And uh, even piperacillin tazobactam is known to raise serum creatinine, especially if you're co-using it with vancomycin. So I would say if I have to pick just three or four drugs, this would be the three or four most commonly used drugs. Of course, nowadays, increasingly, you find uh, NICU babies are forced to use cholestine, which is also a nephrotoxic drug, depending on the organisms in your unit. Uh, so there would be a large number. And I think one of the uh, most impactful studies was the ninja and the baby ninja study, because it did not mandate an intervention. It just made you look at your data that is your child receiving nephrotoxic drug? Is it three nephrotoxic drugs? Have you used aminoglycosides for more than three days? And the unit thinks over it and sees, is there something they can substitute for a nephrotoxic drug to a non-nephrotoxic drug and thus reduce the injury? So by the by this introspection alone, the incidence of AKI came down. So I think especially when we use empirical therapy, if we can avoid a nephrotoxic drug, I think it would uh, help a lot in reducing AKI. And I agree, like baby ninja is something that we can implement in our, our NICU yeah. from tomorrow also. It's like, you know, something to really look at. Uh, another question. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yes, sir. Sir. I think, uh, so uh, we just heard words of wisdom from mom uh, but uh, hardly I think we'll be able to uh, do away from uh, any of these drugs in uh, neutral practice. The, the, uh, mostly where our first line antibiotics right now in most of the units are a combination of uh, Prazil, Tazobactam and uh, Amikacin and we have to fall back to a drug like Vancomycin either as a second line or a third line. And many a times we deal with fungal infections. If they're not responding to fluconazole, obviously we'll be bringing in amphotrisin B. Again, it is a nephrotoxic drug. Rarely, we'll, even if you're considering viral infections, you are bringing in acyclovir. That is also a, a nephrotoxic drug. I think the key here will be the optimization. So the, uh, as it's been rightly pointed out, we can bring in uh, quality improvement measures like what has been shown in a baby ninja trial. The other thing that I want to add, always please just see that even if there is a renal impairment, and uh, even if you are not able to do away from the drug, for most of these nephrotoxic drugs, renal impairment adjustments are available. I don't know how far we've been just uh, scheduling the frequency of these drugs based upon creatinine. We just go with the same dosage most of the times. Once we start looking at actually these values, I'm very sure that uh, we can uh, bring in renal dose adjustments also. Ma'am, would you like to add to that, ma'am? I'm not sure. Uh, will that uh help? I think it is very important to adjust to what we also have tables for this gestational age, this mm -hmm. dose, because that's based on your low GFR. That's the basis on which the dose reduction is there. So if in addition there is a rise in creatinine or something, it actually becomes a very low GFR. So I would still say that maybe there are many non-nephrotoxic, relatively non-nephrotoxic drugs today. So if you do have a choice that it is not that your culture has shown this is the only thing you can use, that you're in a different zone altogether. But if it's not culture-based, if it's empiric, we need to review. Are we overusing vancomycin? You know, I think we are. 
in number of circumstances. I don't say every vancomycin is wrong usage, but I doubt if we need that much of empiric vancomycin in every unit. There may be units where you have staff, et cetera, but the vast majority of uh, Indian scenarios gram negative sepsis, more than gram positive. So I think little more selectivity based on unit organisms periodically evaluated, what you're growing, what is happening, would help you to reduce, if possible, the use of nephrotoxic drug. Second would be combinations. If you have to use a nephrotoxic drug and you have to use a second drug, preferably something which is less nephrotoxic, which would again help in preventing it. And Mangla, one of the things which, uh, you know, ma'am is saying is, is about quality improvement. And uh, one of the things which we looked at, uh, you know, when our cholesterol rate increased because the children would become sick and then, you know, the person on duty would say, I would need to tide over that night. I will put in the cholestin. So we mandated that that cholestin has to be approved by two consultants before use. And the rate of cholestin use decreased by 70%. Like, you know, so so I'm sure we are, what Mam is saying, that we're probably overusing some of the nephrotoxic medicines in our NICUs for sure. Uh, just three more questions. One is dose of caffeine in, um, in AKI uh, for prevention. And then we have one question which has been uh, waiting, and that was in, in the Kedigo classification. Do we need to use both creat and urine output or either one? Or, and which one? And there was one more which I think has been answered. Yeah. So for the caffeine thing, I answer, I'll leave the Kedigo thing for ma'am also. Caffeine was is not like, you know, it's not a primary indication that you need to use caffeine for AKI prevention. Now, the retrospective studies have shown that, like, you know, if you use a higher dose of caffeine, it is more protective. But what is recommended is that we use the same dose as what we use for caffeine for, uh, you know, apnea prevention and use the same dose, which is 20 milligram uh, loading followed by 5 to 8 milligram of uh, maintenance, which also has been shown to prevent and it is better than no AKI. But when we, you tied the, you know, you tease the data more, you find that, like, you know, more than 10 is slightly better than like 5. But for that reason, you do not need to use 10, uh, you know, primary for prevention of AKI because there is no uh, randomized trial which has only looked at AKI, uh, you know, caffeine for prevention of AKI. Yeah. I think regarding the KDGO criteria, if you fulfill either of the two, you can stage according to the highest stage. So if you're, if you're non-oliguric, but your creatinine is falling into stage three, it is stage three. And since many children, by current definition, many neonates would be non-oliguric because we are taking much lower levels than is right for neonates. Uh, it means that you would have to do creatinine periodically and trend that creatinine because it's your rise above your baseline, which you're looking at, uh, to be able to pick up AKI. But either criteria is fulfilled and it's not due to pre-renal causes like your oliguria. You've corrected all that and still it's there. It would be an independent criteria. Thank you. I think we have answered all the questions in the chat. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Kanishka has been answering some questions.